Chapter 10. First Visit Much of Texas reminded Azita of the area she loved as a young child. Tyler, Texas did not. For the most part, it was green with rolling hills and a population near 100,000. Stepping outside of the airport terminal with her bag in hand, Azita smelled a sickeningly strong fragrance of cedar trees in the air. The smell brought up memories of when her family visited on a ranch just outside of Austin, Texas, when two days after arriving, she contracted cedar fever. For weeks after, she lay in bed with an extreme sinus infection. Cedar fever was something she intended on never getting again, and for the fifth time since leaving Washington, D.C., she checked her pocket for her prescription allergy medication. Pushing the memory to the back of her mind was difficult since she remembered every second of her life, with the exception of the time between finding the crystal and joining her new parents. It could be blessing and a curse at times. Happiness swept over her after she spotted a shuttle arriving to transport her to rental car services. She would soon meet Tyler for the first time. After almost an hour standing in line and then arguing with the attendant about the price of her rental car, Azita finally left the airport. The price of her car was of no real concern since money had never been an issue as part of the Kurtwright family. The Kurtwrights had accumulated a great wealth during America's push west, building railroads and opening banks along railway lines. Even in today's world, her father, Bill Bosco Kurtwright, continued the family's success by moving from railroads to building cargo ships that can be seen in almost every colonel port in the world. Bosco was a stickler on ethics and a person keeping to their word, which was something Azita admired about both her fathers. So, even with the excitement of searching for Tyler, she couldn't let an added $5 charge for her rental go without a very good reason why. It always gave her a warm feeling when setting things straight, but that feeling couldn't compare to thoughts of finding Tyler after his assistance in years of research and study. Better start climbing out of your mother's basement, Tyler, because here I come, Azita said, starting her rental truck and dropping a heavy foot down on the accelerator. This was the point of a hunt that most excited her, the point where research over a long period of time came together to achieve the objective. Azita was satisfied with her vehicle selection while driving around in her rental truck, never liking how small modern cars made her feel as others could roll right over her. Azita opened the GPS app on her phone, pulling up the first of three saved addresses she suspected to be Tyler's. She felt it was much too late today to surprise him, but wanted to be ready first thing in the morning. Every street she drove down and mile traveled brought with it high hopes, hope that one of these three places would be Tyler's. Excitement built as the voice of her navigation system spoke. Your destination is on the right. There it was. The first possibility a friend of years could live, a friend she spoke with at least two, maybe even four times a week, yet didn't even know what he looked like. This house wasn't quite what she had imagined since it was an apartment complex. It just didn't fit what Tyler spoke of regarding where he lived, and after years of writing news articles, she understood there to be many descriptive differences between two people. With excitement still building, Azita pulled up to the next address from her list. Driving through heavy traffic most of her way through town to the next location, Azita found it much easier in any city other than in Washington, D.C. For her, the differences had to be in the temperament of drivers. Rather than trying to squeeze in where there was no room between two cars, people here made room and did it with a smile. Azita never liked large cities but knew that in order to work for large news companies, dealing with them was a must. Other than the story about the 25 scientists, her only other story that had not published was on the very subject of the dilapidated usefulness of major cities. Now, driving through town, she couldn't help but wonder for the first time, could they be connected? With that thought, the voice from the GPS announced, Turn left in 1,000 feet. Azita's thoughts refocused, and her fingers twitched on the steering wheel with anticipation as the second address neared. Making the left turn, Azita saw a house a half mile down the road and knew it had to be it even without the GPS stating, in one half mile, your destination will be on the left. She used her thumb to switch the GPS off without taking her eyes from the road. 
even though there was nowhere to park and observe the house without looking suspicious. She was thankful there wasn't any traffic on the road as her foot eased up on the accelerator. Slowly riding along, Azita studied every aspect of the house as she drove past. She then turned around just a little ways down the street and made another pass. Now this is closer to what I had envisioned. Oh look, it even has a basement. Azita laughed at the thought of her presumptions about Tyler actually being correct. Heading back into City of Tyler with the sun already vanishing below a hill-covered horizon, she decided it best to leave her third address till tomorrow. With a few taps of her thumb, the navigation system once again sprang to life and began giving directions to the hotel. The next morning, after four hours of sleep, a very out-of-focus dream, and catching up on the local news, Azita's day began just as every other. Driving around at 4 a.m. in the morning in Tyler, Texas, proved to be very uneventful as she went through countless signal lights flashing yellow for what seemed to be just her. Hours passed as she drove to all the major historical sites and places of interest her navigation system suggested. At 6 a.m., sunrise brought with it a flood of light and traffic. Azita imagined a dam breaking, except instead of water rushing from the other side came a sudden stream of cars. With what she assumed was morning rush hour for Tyler, Texas, now beginning, a tall sign in the distance appeared to her as two pieces of French toast, and not the IHOP sign it really was. Hours had passed since Azita sat down for her favorite morning breakfast of French toast, and the server filled her coffee cup for the sixth time with a smile. Today was a very important day for Azita, and she wanted to be on her game when speaking with Tyler for the first time face to face. Her fingers brushed across her laptop screen, flipping through folders filled with notes. Most contained subjects from research that she and Tyler had done over the years, and others had more current subjects. Coming to the end of her notes, Azita began thinking about which address to try first and saw no further need to wait. Putting everything away, she then pulled a $20 and a $50 bill from her purse before making her way to the front, where an elderly woman waited at the register. Did you have a good breakfast, dear? The raspy-voiced elderly lady asked. Glancing at her name tag, Azita replied, I sure did, Miss Clara. Thank you for asking. Her father had taught her to always use a person's name when talking to them. While responding to Clara's question, she also handed her the $20 bill to pay. Spotting the waitress approaching the table she had occupied for hours, Azita kept a close eye on the waitress's reaction. The woman retained her smile while placing Azita's coffee cup in a tub before wiping down the table, knowing a tip had not been left for her hard work. Not once did she look in Azita's direction with a disgusted expression. Here you go, sweetie, and have a nice day, Clara said with a shaking outstretched hand containing Azita's change. Smiling, Azita took the money and said, You have a great day as well, Clara. She turned to her table, where the waitress was nearly finished cleaning. When Azita neared, the waitress turned, startled, believing Azita had left. I'm so very sorry. I thought you had gone. Give me just a second and I'll get you a fresh cup. Quickly she went to retrieve a new cup of coffee only to stop when Azita spoke up. No, no, that isn't necessary. I just wanted to give you this for your excellent service and patience this morning. Have a great day, Mary, Azita said, handing the $50 bill to Mary, who stood with an astounded look on her face. I... Azita raised her hand. Thank you. Then she walked away. Ever since she had worked undercover in a roadhouse diner for three months, investigating a suspected human smuggling ring, she tipped well according to performance before, during, and after. Mary had been the first to receive a full 50 since starting the grading system almost 10 years ago, and it reinforced her belief that the day was going to be marvelous. With a smile stretched across her face, Azita cruised down roads as her navigation system called out directions. Having cruised by the final house on her list earlier that morning, she really didn't need the system, but it kept her from daydreaming and missing her turns. Excitement filled her with every passing second, and the closest experience to this was waiting for her prom date to pick her up, only this time her date didn't know they were going to meet. Turn right in 500 feet. Your destination will be on the right. 
Azita turned and drove just a few hundred feet down the street when her navigation system said, You have arrived. Your destination is on the right. Yeah, thanks, Azita said, placing the car in park and turning off her navigation system. Taking a few deep breaths and checking herself in the mirror, she was ready to meet her prom date. While stepping out of her car, she let out a deviant giggle, saying, Okay, Tyler, time to climb out of the basement. Walking down the sidewalk in anticipation grew, and now, as she was about to stand in front of what could possibly be Tyler's door, the thought occurred to her. What if he can't get out of the basement? By the time her thought was over, she had already knocked and footsteps could be heard. Hope this is the right house, otherwise it is going to be a long morning, Azita muttered right before the door opened to reveal a young woman in her late twenties. Hello, I am Azita Kurtwright. Is Tyler home? Azita spoke casually as if she had been there before, assuming the young slender woman was possibly Tyler's sister. In a strong southern accent, the women cheerfully replied, Well, hello there, I'm Sarah, I'll call him right up. He spends most of the day downstairs. Come on in. Can I get you anything? Coffee, perhaps? Azita fought hard to keep from blurting out, I knew it. Instead, she focused on the offer of coffee. Yes, if it is not too much trouble, I would love some. It wasn't till after she had said yes that the thought occurred to her, This better be the right house, or else I am just stopping at total strangers' homes to have coffee now. Sarah waved Azita into her home as she turned, walked over, leaned downstairs, and called out, Tyler, you have a guest. Then Sarah turned back and, with a big smile on her face, walked over with arms extended at her sides. I am so happy to finally meet you, Azita. I've read all your articles and followed everything you and my husband have worked on. I'm sorry. It just seems like we've known each other for years. Let me get that coffee. Feeling she should reach up and close her dropped jaw, Azita wasn't sure if it had dropped from her first guess being the correct house, Sarah being so nice, or the fact this lovely woman was married to a man climbing up from the basement. As Tyler appeared near the top of the stairs, Azita realized all her stereotypical ideas of a ufologist didn't fit in Tyler's case. Now walking toward her with a bizarre look on his face was a clean-shaved, slender man with a nice haircut and decent clothes. What are you doing here? Tyler wasted no time asking. With that being the best reaction she had imagined receiving, Azita replied, It was about time for us to meet. We've worked together for years, and I only knew you by a voice. Come with me. Tyler spoke with what Azita assumed was his attempt of being assertive with her, though with his slight wisp and a childlike voice, it didn't work for him. As they headed downstairs, he called back to his wife, Honey, we will be in my office. Even though Tyler didn't wait for a response, close behind Azita, Sarah's voice followed them with, I'll bring coffee down when it's finished. While making her way down the stairs, Azita smiled as she thought, Now this is what I had pictured. All along the walls leading down into the basement was a variety of swords. Once Tyler's office, as he called it, came into view, it completed her image with toy aliens, fire-in-the-sky posters, and many other collectibles. There was even a framed copy of the results for the tests done on the material found on Betty Hill's dress after her and her husband's 1961 abduction. Yet that was more impressive than nerdy, even Azita had to admit it. She could tell that Tyler also had what looked like a sophisticated computer system, as lights flashed on his personal server, four monitors, and a police band radio playing just loud enough to hear. Again, more impressive than nerdy. Walking over to his monitors and pulling up security cameras showing the front and backyard, Tyler began to speak after checking everything was clear. You know how much trouble I go through to keep anyone from connecting us together? It wasn't just for the fun of it, I assure you that. Azita expected him to be a little upset by her dropping in, but what she sensed from him was true fear. Hoping to ease the shock from her unexpected arrival, Azita didn't answer his question, but instead asked him, You remember when I investigated Scorpion Lake? 
Tyler still glared at her but struggled to push aside her torching their non-existent connection as he replied, Yes. Remember the abandoned beer I found where someone had been partying and left? Azita asked, setting things up for her big reveal. Yes, and none of them in the video were old enough or purchased alcohol, Tyler stated, obviously frustrated with everything while retrieving surveillance video of them leaving the station. Silently, Azita and Tyler stood by his long desk full of monitors as the video played. Just as the truck backed up, Azita commanded, Pause it. Tyler studied the video for signs of what Azita suggested was there. Just as his eyes made contact with it, he dropped into his chair and his mood visibly changed. Dancing his fingers over his keyboard, the image filled the screen, revealing two cases of beer. It was them! he exclaimed. Azita took a seat next to him, where she assumed his wife sat assisting in searching countless hours of videos and emails. Amazed by how clearly Tyler had enhanced the image and the speed in which he had worked, she became curious as to how much he might have found out about her with his computer skills. What happened to the fourth boy? They said there were three missing. Where is the fourth? Tyler asked. Once again smiling, Azita replied, That is why we need to work together and find out. It's our first lead with possible proof of abduction. She could smell the aroma of coffee filling the air, and even though she had had a great deal that morning, Azita was already anticipating another cup. Tyler's fingers excitedly tapped even faster across his keyboard as if the tempo of music had picked up. I should be able to find it fairly easy. Azita wanted to help, but knew from experience in situations such like this where she did not know the programming that the best thing to do was to be quiet. Fascinated, she watched images on the monitor change as Tyler worked with the only sounds coming from him, striking the keys and a barely audible police scanner that caught her attention. Central, we have a code on 02 at 1576 East Meadows. East Meadows? Azita thought as she pulled out her phone, opening the navigation app. As soon as she tapped its screen, opening up previous searches, her stomach knotted up. The address, 1576 East Meadows, appeared. I was just there yesterday, Azita said, thinking Tyler might have heard the police radio as well. Seeing that he was fully engaged searching for the fourth boy, she nudged him on the shoulder. I am almost there. Tyler didn't look away from the screen. No, listen, Azita pointed it toward his police scanner. Dispatch, requesting more personnel for crowd control. Tyler asked, what is it? Search for live news at 1576 East Meadows. I was just there yesterday looking for you. Just then, Azita heard Sarah making her way down the stairs, bringing them coffee, something Azita now wished had a splash of whiskey or more. With a few strokes, Tyler found live news feeds, and they both turned their attention to the rumbling middle-aged reporter. Mark Vandergrift reporting for KWLR Channel 4 News. Reports are slowly coming in of a mass shooting here at East Meadows Apartments, where suspect Tyler Hall executed four of his neighbors before turning the gun on himself. At this time, there is no known motive. All the color left Tyler's face as he heard their suspect's name and turned to Azita, who was still watching. You were there yesterday? he asked with panic in his voice. Azita turned her attention from the reporter to Tyler when something quickly drew her attention. With a gasp, Azita yelled, No! She was helpless to stop the horrific sight of Sarah swinging one of the swords from the stairway, striking Tyler in his neck.